That deserves applause. Rejoice the Lord is King. Mike, thank you so much. So good morning. Welcome to First Church Congregational. I'm Bill Ingraham, I'm senior pastor, and it is my honor to welcome you today and to celebrate this day with you. I don't know about you, I am grateful for the rain outside. We needed it so very much. Um, and I'm grateful to be here. To everyone who's watching online, thank you for joining us today. Do please make sure to post a little note to let folks know you are here, um, the online community. And also, if you can, like or heart or um, share. That just helps us reach more people in the online world, and we appreciate that. And then for folks who are here today, we like to give a welcome gift to people who are here for the first time. It's a coffee mug um, with our name on it and a little cross inside. If there's anyone here for the first time today, would you raise your hand and an usher will bring you a mug? Okay, we get to keep our mugs this week. Okay. Um, all right, let's see. I wonder why I wrote down on my announcement list after worship. There you go. That's the first announcement after worship. I have no idea what that means, but it's on my announcements. So we'll just, it, it's a special surprise. I hope that everything's okay. So um, I'm going to kind of mix things up today and intersperse joys and concerns with the announcements at the beginning. This is not a week that we have a lot of meetings. And so I got a text from Jen Borslow Friday night that her daughter, Lauren, and that's Lauren and her husband is Josh um, Dollinger, had their baby. Lauren was in labor for 30 hours. So Asher Kurth Dollinger was born a baby boy, 8.1 pounds and 21 inches long. Um, so that is a great joy. Also in that family, we know that Margaret Kurth had gone on hospice. This time last week, we were concerned because she had really taken a sudden drop in her capacity. She's really, uh, she's kind of superwoman. She's come back, she's doing well. Um, she's still exhibiting um, signs that say hospice is appropriate, but we don't know what it's going to mean as far as timing goes. So keep Margaret in your prayers and also um, Jen and her other two children and their spouses and their children um, as she goes through this time. Of course, you all know by now that George King died on Wednesday this week. It was the day before his and Pat's 49th anniversary. Um, so it's very hard to have lost George, an incredibly um, beloved member of this congregation. But I want to say, I am so glad he did not suffer long. He was surrounded by his family and his friends. Um, he had had plenty of time to say his I love yous and his goodbyes, as had the family. And so while my heart is very sad with grief, I also am grateful um, because he was well cared for and not in pain and surrounded by love. That service will be this Saturday. The service is at 11 o'clock here in the church. For the hour before, there will be visitation also here in the church. And then after the service, we will do the interment outside of the memorial garden. And then we will go into parish hall. There's going to be a catered lunch. The choir will be singing on Saturday. If anybody wants to join the funeral choir, just speak with Mike after worship. If you haven't already, he'll be glad to talk to you. Anybody can come and join the funeral choir, and they will be rehearsing that morning, I believe, in the ladies' parlor is what we plan. In Phillips Chapel. Okay. So just at the end of the hall in Phillips Chapel. That's, it'll be more room. You can actually face them like a choir there. That'll be good. Um, so those are my announcements about those two things. Lots of love for Pat and for their boys and for everyone in this church who's grieving the loss of George. Um, next Sunday is our... Um, Observation of Mental Health Awareness Sunday. So somebody who is no stranger to this church, in fact, used to be a member here, Marianne Thibault um, Vandette will be preaching. She's a hospice chaplain, an ordained minister in the UCC. Of course, I'll be here. I'll do all my normal parts of worship that day. Um, but do please plan to be here next Sunday for our Mental Health Awareness Sunday. And then the last thing is just to say about the food pantry. Um, the numbers have been going up. Um, as you know, some of the federal programs that were providing extra assistance ended a month ago, and on Tuesday night we served right at or just over 400 families. So a very important part of our ministry each week, 
hosting and then doing a whole lot of the work of the Neighbors in Need Food Pantry here on Tuesdays. Those are the announcements I have for today with joys and concerns interspersed with them. Um, we hold other prayers in our hearts, prayers for people with any expression of mental illness, prayers for people in need of healing of body, mind, or spirit, prayers for people um, seeking to find their way in uncertain times. Um, and then, as always, words of gratitude that we get to be together and offer God our praise. We now begin our service of worship as we bring in the light of Christ. Please join me for the call to worship. Today's scripture begins with the words, now on that same day. That same day means that our scripture passage transpires on Easter day. The passage refers to two of them who were on the road going to Imamus. We don't know their names, but we know they were followers of Jesus. Jesus came and joined them walking, but they did not recognize him. They even told him what had happened, having no idea of his identity. They say Jesus interpreted to them what the scriptures say concerning him. At supper, when he blessed and broke the bread, finally they could see.
please join me in the morning prayer. Most gracious and loving God, we have come into this place to magnify your name and to worship you. We long to encounter the risen Christ, grounding our lives in the hope and the new life his resurrection portend. Give us open eyes to see his presence among us and open hearts to know your love and compassion for us and for all. And through this hour and all the hours of our lives, help us to be faithful that we might walk with Jesus all our days. These things we pray in his holy name. Amen. be seated and I invite children to come forward for a moment with me here on the stairs. Good to see ya. So have you ever had a moment when you were telling somebody something and you could tell just looking in their eyes, they had no idea what you're talking about. Have you ever had that? I sure have. So let me ask the other side of that question. Have you ever had a time that somebody was talking to you, telling something, and you realized you had no idea what they were talking about? Okay. So you all have had each of those experiences. So I'm convinced that sometimes... When I'm telling somebody something and they have no idea what I'm talking about, it might be because I've not gonna, done a good job of explaining what I'm saying. Or maybe even that what I'm saying whoo, is coming in from another direction and it's just not anything they anticipate my saying and so they don't even know how to hear what I'm saying. So, and then there have also been times when somebody's talking to me and I have no idea what they're talking about and I think, did I get distracted? Did I miss something? I see his lips moving, but I don't know what he's talking about. Is he speaking Swahili? What's going on? So there are times you don't understand, and there are times you're not understood, and it's really kind of a, well, let me ask, how did that, so when you've been the one talking and somebody didn't understand, how did that make you feel? So you're talking, and you can tell from their eyes that they don't understand. Do you remember that? How it, how it made you feel? What you thought at the time? Or can you just imagine? Okay, that's okay. Well, what about when somebody's talking to you and you don't understand them? How has that felt? Yeah. Oh, that's so good. So she just said, well, I just say I don't understand. <laughs> isn't, that kind of, isn't that kind of the solution? Ah, our kids are so smart, they always cut right to the base of what's going on that I'm trying to talk about. That's right, just let people know you don't understand. So today in the scripture passage, it's a story about um, two disciples that were walking along on the road to Emmaus. And I had said in the call to worship that we don't know what their names are. That's not true. We don't know one of the names. The other name we know. And you'll hear it when Steve reads the scripture Later today, it's Cleopas. Um, and um, Jesus shows up to them. It's a little different from not understanding what they're saying, but they don't know who he is. Jesus. They're his disciples. They're his followers, but they don't know who he is. Now, to their credit, they did know that he had just been crucified, and they didn't understand that he had been resurrected, so it makes sense that they wouldn't quite know. Um, but they just did not get it. But they talk to him and they listen to him and eventually it's amazing it's when um, so it wasn't 
any of the stuff that he told them, even though he told them all about him. It wasn't any of the stuff that they told him, even though they told him all about what had gone on. It was once they had invited him into where they were staying and they had asked him to say the prayer before the meal, the blessing. And it was when Jesus offered thanks to God and broke the bread all at once. Ding! They understood who he was and it all became clear to them. That was that moment they understood. What I love about the story, well, there's a lot of things I love about the story and you'll hear it in the sermon, but one of the things I love about the story is they hung in there with him and he hung in there with them and eventually they are able to figure out who they were with. And so kind of like being willing to say, I'm sorry, I don't understand, but keep listening. Or being able to say to somebody when they don't understand me, well, help me, what will... What's missing? What will help you understand? Sticking with it with each other until we can get there together. Yeah, what you thinking? Well, sometimes I say, can you re repeat that again? I'm sorry? Repeat that again. Yeah, repeat that again. Or maybe say it a little different way. Um, yeah, so anyway, well, that's funny. I've got to this place. I'm not even sure I know what my point was other than we stick at it together until we understand together. And I really believe there are some things that you all understand that I need to hear and the adults need to hear um, because there's insights that you have that nobody else has. And likewise, everybody in this room has an understanding of something um, that none of the rest of us do. And so in community, we all live together and we listen to each other and we talk with each other and we try to come to understand together. So thank you very much. I'm going to say a prayer. Let's do a repeat after me prayer. Dear God, help us to listen. Help us to pay attention. Help us to be clear. And mostly, help us to be together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for coming up. It's just I was just taken back to a one room open country church in Copper Canyon, Texas. Um, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. I changed key, I know, um, but what Mike just played. Well, we have a time for prayer now, and I ask you to join me as we offer our prayers together. Let us pray. Here we are, loving God, in this very place, and we are grateful that this day we can gather in your name and pray. It is dark outside and even a little dark inside because rain is falling, which this world needs so much. We are grateful for the rain, for the flowers, for the grass, for the trees. And we're grateful for your love that is showered upon us too, that touches us in our relationships with each other, that touches us in our relationship with you, that touches us just upon entering this room. We are so grateful. Bless us, we pray. Do help us to sense your presence here and your word made known for us from Jesus, your spirit stirring among us and inspiring us, the love we share with each other and with you. Help us to sense the blessings of being here, that our lives might be made richer and fuller. Our faith might grow more deep within us and our capacity to live our days walking in the ways of Jesus to be strengthened, expanded, empowered. That when we walk from this room, whether it's to Parish Hall for refreshments afterwards or returning to our lives wherever we may go, we could be filled with a sense of your love that sustains us, your word that inspires us, your presence that empowers us, your blessings 
that heal us. We do offer prayers this morning for um, people who need healing, healing of body or mind or spirit. We offer prayers for people recovering from surgery, people facing surgery, people in long-term need of healing from surgery or facing long-term ongoing chronic medical issues. We pray for people in every um, level and expression of mental or emotional health, especially those who are living with mental illness. We are grateful for therapies. We are grateful for medications. We are grateful for communities that offer love and support and also boundaries that bring safety and accountability and inspire us in how we can be together in the midst of all our different mental and emotional needs and realities. We pray for healing. We pray for wholeness. We pray for patience with one another and for a love that will sustain us, whatever we might face. Aware of our own shortcomings, we ask your blessing for forgiveness for the ways we have gone astray, for um, the capacity to learn to become something broader and bigger than we are, to work against prejudice and hatred within us, to move beyond fear, to love and compassion and a, a sense of dignity in all your people that it can inspire how we live with one another in our church, in this community, in the world. And we pray for all those who grieve. We especially pray for the family of Pat and George King in George's death, grateful for his being held now and always in your loving care. But in all the ways we grieve, we ask your blessing. And we are grateful for the gift of new life the birth of a baby this week that reminds us that while we live in the present, we always are hopeful toward the future and strive to make love and compassion known, to welcome new life and new possibilities and to live into them together. We pray for this church. Help us to be a place of safety and of welcome. Help us to bear witness to love and compassion. Whatever we do, help us to continue to make a difference in lives of people, whether it's um, physical hunger or spiritual hunger. Help us to find our way into your future as we faithfully live in the present. All these prayers we pray to you today and take a moment now in the still quietness of our hearts to offer you the prayers we have come to pray. Hear now our prayers. These things we ask in the name of Jesus. As we say together the prayer he taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
I'm often amazed at things we can do when we strive to do them together. It's amazing how many jobs are hard to do on your own, but can be done when we join with others of like minds and like hearts. We don't even have to be of like minds. We just have to agree that we're going to work together on something. And one of the things that symbolizes that is the offering. And we are able as a congregation to support all the ministry of this church and more um, because we come together blessed as each one of us is from God's um, bounty, God's love for us, our capacities to earn and um, maintain our incomes. We come together and we do remarkable things. One of the remarkable things we've done together that I meant to mention in the announcements that I'm going to mention now Um, So one of them, we sit in this room and it's raining today. Do you remember when we had moved all the cushions over here because the roof was leaking? It was before the pandemic. It's been a while now. Um, But we managed to fix the roof in record time and pay for it cash. Um, We've been working on the bell towers through the summer. We totally fixed the outside of the bell tower. It doesn't leak anymore. And finally, the inside has been cleared of everything, anything that might be a problem. It's completely dry. It's been sanitized and cleaned up. And in fact, after worship, if you want, the lights are on out there. Walk out those doors and look, you will not believe it. And if it's during the postlude, all the better because the organ echoes out there, unlike it does in this room. And that's because we all came together. We pooled our resources and we pooled our prayers and our love and support and our patience. And we've accomplished it, it's not done. We still have to raise money to redo the plaster, Um, but as it is right now, we can walk through it and it's perfectly safe. So I hope you'll do that today. And when you look, recognize we've done that together. Um, It's easy to forget that this place stands by God's blessing because we as members offer our support in real ways, tangible, tangible ways to see to it that this is a welcoming place, a safe place, a beautiful place where we can offer God our praise. That was an awfully long invitation to the offering, um, but that's exactly what I'm doing, inviting us to continue to offer our support that we might praise God in this place and make a difference in the world. I invite the ushers to come forward to receive our offering.
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, We thank you, God, for all your blessings and the bounty you share with us and ask you to receive these gifts we offer and bless them to be used to do your will here in this church and in the world. Amen. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35, which can be found on pages 860 and 861 in your pew Bible. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Imamas, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them. 
What things, they replied. The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was the prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women in our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back to us and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets said to them. Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all of the prophets had declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. And they came near to the village to which they were going. He walked ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they were told what happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. May the living word of God speak to us through these ancient words of scripture. Thank you, Steve. So we switched gospels, and I think it's worth um, setting the stage of this gospel compared to where we were just last week. We were in the Gospel of John, and the Gospel of John, um, the first one to find the empty tomb, and the one who encounters first the resurrected Jesus is Mary Magdalene, and it's only she. Remember, um, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. Um, uh, the, in the garden hymn really is a hymn about Mary Magdalene. Um, in the garden alone, encountering Jesus and wanting to stay with him. This is the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, well, in the Gospel of Luke, um, there's just lots of people are disciples. They're bigger. And so it's referring to the 11 and all the others. Um, and when it names the disciples who were walking along the road on this day, on the way to Emmaus, a seven-mile walk, what would that be, two and a half hours maybe, depending on how fast you walk, um, one of them, Cleopas, the other one, we don't know the names, but Cleopas, not a name of one of the 12. And in fact, at the tomb, it wasn't just Mary Magdalene, it was a whole bunch of people. In fact, I'm going to read it to you. Um, now, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, um, and the other women who told this to the apostles. So it's a group of women in the Gospel of Luke, not Mary Magdalene. And it's in the Gospel of Luke, one of my favorite um, uh, statements of Jesus when he says, sisters, go and tell my brothers. Um, it's a wonderful story of um, being empowered to be evangelists, this group of faithful women who showed up at the tomb. So now we have the road to Emmaus. 
And it's amazing to me, you know, the scripture, the sermon title is Open Eyes, and it's amazing to me how scripture passages that I've dealt with over and over and over again for decades, I've been a pastor, what, 35 years, getting close to 40, um, and I've heard this passage since I was a little kid, so what do you think, maybe I understood it since I was 55, maybe, I mean, understood what was being read to me, um, but something came to me, my eyes were opened um, as I read it, I think on Tuesday, um, the day George died. It says they were walking along and when Jesus um, came to them, it said um, they stood still looking sad. And that just hit me. Um, they stood still looking sad. I've often wondered what it would have been like for them walking on the road to Emmaus. For whatever reason, they end up not staying where the 11 are and all the other disciples are. It's in the Gospel of John that they're locked in the upper room, not in this um, Gospel, but clearly they're all together somewhere. Uh, they are walking to Emmaus together, and I can imagine the crestfallen nature of their walk. Do you remember walking in grief and loss? And it can be expressed in your body, not just in your words. I, I imagine that with them. I also was talking this week about all things um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and had somebody explain it to me in a way that I had never heard before, which is, we live with a sense of a bubble of safety and security of normalcy. And it's just the, the world we inhabit. It's literally almost like a bubble around us. And then something happens that pierces that bubble and it pops and it ceases to exist. It might be a physical trauma. It might be the loss of a loved one. It might be the loss of a job. It might be a, it, it could be all sorts of things where all at once that kind of bubble of normalcy around us that allows us just to live our lives as ourselves. Maybe it's your happy-go-lucky self or maybe it's your grumpy, um, go-not-lucky self. I don't know. Um, but it just allows you to be who you are in the world day in, day out. And that moment changes your capacity. I, I think they were in a moment of grief and loss and what they had hoped for, what they had dreamt of, what they had been talking into living for. Um, even though Jesus had told them in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus warns them what's going to happen, they still were finding themselves after the crucifixion and the word of the empty tomb, unable yet to comprehend. And so when Jesus encounters them and he um, appears among them and speaks to them, they just, they just stand there looking sad. That realization may be one of the most human personal connections I've felt with the disciples in a long time. Because I can remember times I was standing there just looking sad or have seen loved ones or friends or strangers or parishioners standing there looking sad. And I love the example that the scripture gives us. I know next week we'll, when Mary Ann preaches, we'll get to talk about grief. Um, and that'll be the focus of next week's sermon and healing from grief and the blessings of God's love and presence with us in the midst of grief. But I want to just name a little bit about what Jesus does with them. He walks with them. He joins them in their walk and he walks with them. They're looking sad and feeling sad and their bubble has burst and their world is different and they don't know how they're going to carry on. Maybe they're contemplating, okay, we thought that would work. Now I'll um, sell firewood for a living or whatever. I, I don't know. He, he walks with them. He just, he just walks with them. I know in some of my most difficult moments, maybe, maybe you've had this too. The biggest blessing is not the person that has just the right word to say. 
The biggest blessing is not the person that has the act of healing or whatever, although that's welcome on any time. But the biggest blessing probably is the people who have just walked with me and have listened. Jesus asks them what they're talking about. And they talk to him. He doesn't begin talking about who he is. He never says outright who he is. He starts by listening. And they describe him. Can you imagine that? Describing Jesus to Jesus? But they do. They talk about all the things that he did, that he was a, a prophet and a healer, and they had really thought he was the Messiah, the Son of God, but that he had been killed, and now it's three days later, and some of the women who are among us, they said they found an empty tomb, but it seems to us an idle tale. That's the second time in this gospel um, that it gets mentioned. When they first show up to the disciples, it says they hear their words as an idle tale, and now they say they heard the words as an idle tale. Jesus showed up, and he walked with them. Do we have, do we have the heart for that as a church? And, and it takes both sides, right? Both it takes the side of showing up and walking with someone in their time of grief, their time of loss, their time of uncertainty, their time of trouble, their time, whatever it is. It takes showing up and joining them and being present and listening. But it, when, when we are the ones who are standing there looking sad, it takes our opening up to letting somebody walk with us. I can remember a number of times people have offered their help and I've wanted to turn it away because I want to do it on my own. I'm going to make it. Um, instead of saying, thank you. Yes. Please walk with me. Let me just tell my story. <laughs> As you can imagine, um, I don't have a hard time telling my story. That part I've got down. Uh, when, I remember when my mother died and I was dealing with that tremendous loss, that first big loss of the woman who had given me life and held me in her arms. And, um, and one of my friends, one of my close friends said, Bill, at some point you're gonna feel like people are tired of hearing the story of your mom's death. I was lucky enough to be there. She said, you're gonna feel like people are tired of hearing the story, but I want you to know I'll listen to it as many times as you wanna tell it, I don't care. Say it over and over, repeat yourself. I'll listen. What a gift. So to be present and to listen and to walk, but also to be willing ourselves to be joined and to open up and to share. And then the remarkable thing, they, they didn't recognize who Jesus was. I can't really blame them. They weren't expecting to see the resurrected Jesus. They had thought it was an idle tale and as far as they were concerned, Everything they had hoped for had ended, and they were just trying to find their way to the next town over for whatever was next for them. But as he walks for them, he begins to open up to them the scripture, and he teaches them all the, all the things about himself that fulfilled the scriptures and made it clear that he was the Messiah. Still, they didn't understand who he was, but they heard. He, he offered them words they needed to hear. I don't want to put pressure on us to offer words that people need to hear because I'm convinced that often we try to move too quickly to saying the words people need to hear and we don't listen to the grief that needs to be shared. I think we rush too much to the words of comfort. There's not always the right word of comfort other than walking with and loving. If you have the words, say them, but don't feel a need to rush to them. And so Jesus has done just that. And the next part I love. When they got to the place they were going to stay, um, Jesus acted like he was going to walk on. He was going to carry on his way and go on. Um, and they stop him and entreat him to abide with them. That's the closing hymn, Abide With Me. Soft, fast falls the evening tide. Um, they invite Jesus to stay. What? What would have happened if they hadn't invited him to stay? 
Would we have the hymn abide with me for one question? But would they have found the healing that happened? They didn't, they didn't know it was Jesus. This reminds me of the scriptures about um, entertaining angels unawares. They, they, they know that they should offer him shelter and food. It's the right thing to do. And after all, he's joined them. He's listened to them. Um, he's taught them. So they honor him and say, please, stay. And he does. And it's not until they're eating together. And they give him, as the honored guest, a chance to offer the prayer. That happens to me a lot, but I get, I get paid to pray. <laughs> so when, when I'm in people's homes, people often offer me to say the prayer. What's really um, cool is when I'm among Colleagues, so all of us get paid to pray. Um, and the host will turn to me and say, Hey, Bill, how about you offer the prayer? When I was in seminary, we used to have a, a thing we would do when we sat down because we wanted to pray for a meal, but we didn't you know, want anybody to hog it. And so when we sat down, once the, when the food was placed on the table, we all put up our thumb. And the last person to get their thumb up had to pray. <laughs> Little seminary thing. Anyway, they honor this guy who had been walking with them and say why don't you say the blessing and Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks to God and he broke it and he shared it with them and in that moment their eyes were opened and they knew who he was and they believed in that moment their world changed because whether they had understood it or not, right there in front of them was the resurrected Lord that they had seen crucified. Right there in front of them, they recognized the one who had been teaching them was the one who had taught them before that inspired them to leave their lives that they had been before and become his follower and now inspired them to live um, again as his followers after his resurrection. And then, poof, Jesus disappeared and he no longer was there. And it says they go back and they talk to the disciples. I wonder, did they eat first? I hope they ate first. They had been walking two and a half, three hours and they're about to walk back two and a half, three hours. I hope, I hope they ate before they went. If nothing else, packed it up and ate it on the road. But they, it was such good news. They had to go and tell. Their eyes were open and they could see. And it made all the difference. Okay, so just some closing random thoughts about eyes open. Sometimes our eyes are open unbidden from us, right? I didn't expect to have this different insight into the scripture this week. I just did. I just saw right there that they were standing still and they looked sad. And I connected with two disciples I don't know that I've ever connected with before. So being aware when our eyes are opened. Another is having our eyes open enough to recognize where someone is and what it is they need from us. You won't always get it right. There are times you mess up, Lord knows I do, but a time you recognize somebody needs you to be present and just to walk, just to listen, and so go and walk and listen or sit, just be present. Another is to have your Eyes open when it's time to listen, to have your eyes open when it is time to talk, and then be ready for when our eyes are opened and we understand something in such a different way that our whole lives are changed. These two followers that had figured out um, and thought that all was lost, all at once found out, in fact, all was not lost. And though they did not know what the future held, they knew that the promise of life and hope that Jesus proclaimed from God was true. And they could count on it. And it changed everything for how they lived. Their eyes were opened. Please pray with me. Loving God, open our eyes. 
Help us to see. But more importantly, abide with us. That we could sense your comfort and your presence and be inspired that we might live after Christ's example. We ask this in his most holy name. Amen.
Hear now the benediction. Trust that God comes to us in the Christ in our most difficult and lonely and sad moments and walks with us and helps us to find our way and know too that he teaches us how we can do the same, that as a community, we can live both with Christ's presence and as Christ's people. Go in peace, love God, serve God's children. Amen. Thank you.